a lot of the animals around, like bull elephants and other animals using and frequenting the marsh, they still move between muddy pans where the water is not very good. Even though the river is less than a kilometer from where they are, they still choose to use this old water source. It is going to take a long time for them to readjust and realize that better water has returned. Zebras and wildebeest returning from their migration en route back from Mababi moving through the marsh also use water holes that are provided by the wildlife department of this area, water holes that are pumped. They too don't realize that the river has returned and is just within reach of them. Everything in this environment is going to have to reset itself back to the days of when the Savuti Channel was flowing and the marsh was full of life. We were on our way to film baboons when the road we were traveling on was blocked by these two male African buffaloes. Now there seemed to be a bit of competitive behavior taking place here. It seems that these two were not being particularly aggressive, but one was definitely giving the other one the chase. I could see that these were two mature males because their horns were massive and the um, central horn base or boss as it's called was very distinct. The horns were also quite rigid and textured, an indication of age. They seem to be of similar size but I take for granted that the one was a bit older and as happens in nature, the older has to make way for the younger and the dominance hierarchy will be established. The day was starting for the baboons when we started to film them. They were up on the summit and this is quite typical for baboons because they lodge diurnal and they will be up on the huge slopes, the top of mountains or the top of trees, which would be their places of safety for resting up over the evening. It seems at some stages that the message got out that it was time to move down, probably just to find water and as well as to forage for food. And they started their process down this huge mountainside. I think it's especially the youngsters that had a lot of fun with this. And it seemed to be a bit of a game for all of them, in fact. When they reached the valley floor, I picked up a little group playing in a kippersol tree. They seemed to be having a bit of fun, as well as probably foraging for food. I heard an alarm call for one of the baboons, and we looked in the sky, there was a martial eagle hovering overhead. The baboons disappeared into the undergrowth, and we didn't see too much of them after that.
as the tide started to recede, it started to expose a lot of the intertidal animals and plants that you find in these rock pools. Lots of big kelp beds were starting to get exposed. Along the, the rocky shorelines, you start finding lots of mussel beds, lots of limpets. And it's these nutrient-rich little animals that start attracting a lot of the bird life into this particular area. The smaller of the bird species that we came across this morning were the heart lip gulls. These birds form small breeding colonies that you find on a lot of the offshore islands here on the west coast. Quite often they will share these little colonies with terns and other smaller bird species. They'll then move across to the mainland and feed mainly on small invertebrates that they find in and amongst these little rocky outcrops. And whenever there's quite a lot of bird activity and the promise of an easy meal, one will always find the kelp gulls lurking in the near vicinity. Pretty well adapted animals, really nicely webbed feet, as well as a nice insulation of feathers and a really strong beak, which they'll use for prying off little limpets and mussels on these rocky outcrops. Unfortunately, there'll always be one or two victims of these extreme weather conditions. This morning it was one of the kelp gulls just resting up in the lee of one of the rocky outcrops and very very tired. He was pretty badly injured.